I knew it was there. I knew there's always kind of a background noise of plastic on the beach, you know, after for all those years of kayaking and surfing um, and just being at the beach. You knew it was there, but until you actually start counting it, until you actually get down on your hands and knees and dig underneath a log and find 10 more pieces where you thought there was one, then you start, you don't really know what's there. You don't really, you don't really have a good concept of it. I think that's one thing that's changed for me as I've done that enough times now that I can't really go to a beach without seeing it. I can't not see the plastic. No. For me, um, I started by going down the Washington coast with a couple other guys by kayak, uh, surveying beaches uh, specifically for marine debris. We went kind of thinking we were gonna find tsunami debris and we did, but just the overwhelming amount of debris uh, was what I came away with thinking that okay this is something that needs to needs to be more well known. We are in about the most remote location you can get to in Southeast Alaska. Um, not very many towns, not very many people anywhere within 100 miles of us here really. Um, and we're here to document marine debris on the beaches uh, using surveys, using water sampling, and then also cleaning up some pretty remote wilderness beaches. What do you think you're gonna find? Nothing. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna be anything in it. Yeah. But it's good to check. Right? Yeah. If that's the case, it'll be the first one we've ever done. Is there anything? Yeah. Everywhere we look, freshwater systems, we find plastic at some level. And even with Ken's work, he we're just finished looking at liter samples of water. So you think about a, a regular drink bottle and in the equivalent volume of water from Alaska, these remote areas, we're still finding filaments of plastic. I think that the thing about cleaning beaches here that's different than cleaning beaches elsewhere in more, if you will, civilized uh, situations uh, is that it just brings into sharper focus the consequences of our decisions as a society. Those decisions are being made far away from here but the consequences are here. And, and if you come here and you clean up a beach here and you realize how connected we are, even though it seems like we're so remote, how connected we are um, based on the decisions that we've made. I think that's probably the big takeaway for me. You know, if you're cleaning up a beach near Seattle or near Los Angeles or somewhere where there's a river mouth and there's a lot of stuff, debris on the beach, you can, you can kind of in your head figure out, okay, this is how that happened. But you get here, it's like, we're 100 miles from the nearest town. Um, how'd this happen? Professionally, I'm a conservation biologist, and that work usually involves marine systems, threatened seabirds, island systems, and through that work, it's led me into plastics-related research. Now in our lab, we're working on water samples, like the work with Ken. We're working on marine species at a variety of trophic levels in the food web, so forage fish, ground fish, uh, filter feeders like mussels. Ken and I have known each other for a number of years now through the sea kayaking community, and, and then as Ken's work began to focus more explicitly on marine plastics, there was an, a really nice opportunity to collaborate. You know, with my research lab here at the university, I could provide him with kind of the scientific background and expertise and also resources to help him do the analyses that helps him tell a broader story, um, an important story about how plastic is pervasive in our lives, in the natural systems that we live in and around. There's a lot of garbage that ends up going from human use into the ocean. Um, there's anything from building supplies to lumber to food to all kinds of things. The difference between all those other things and plastic is 
that plastic is always going to be with us. It gets smaller and smaller, but it doesn't go away. It doesn't biodegrade. It photodegrades. Light can break it down into smaller and smaller pieces, but it never really returns to the elements that it's made of. So what that means is, for all intents and purposes, everything plastic that has ever been made is still out there. The Akatsu Project, I got the idea for the name Akatsu uh, from the Japanese word that means together or united as one in the sense that when the waitress comes to your table and says, is this going to be separate checks or is this together? Are you going to pay for this together? And in my mind, that's exactly what we're doing with plastic. We're paying for this together. We need to figure out a way to do that. Uh, you look at the ocean and you think Japan is a long way from here. I mean, that's uh, it's, it's a half a world away. and yet. Things from Japan are now washing up on our shores. We're together. The oceans don't keep us apart. The oceans bring us together. And that's uh, exactly what I'm trying to get to with the Akatsu Project, is you can think you're not a part of it, but you are. Cape Decision is one of the best land-based marine mammal observation points that I've ever been to across the state of Alaska. We're just surrounded by incredible wildlife all the time. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, this is a really remote location, probably one of the most remote lighthouses in Alaska. Um, so when you get here, you see wilderness. I mean, you see islands and you see the ocean and, and lots of wildlife. Um, and then the dichotomy of having this place where you can go and eat breakfast and it's cooked on a stove and there's you know, all the kind of creature comforts of home, of course, except for the, the connectivity. So um, the wilderness is something that you see. It's something you can't not see because you're completely surrounded by it all the time. Forest ecology has been something I've taught for 35 years and I'm surrounded by it. We're living in it and, and we, we foraged off it. We've been eating a few things along the way, berries and more berries and a few fiddleheads and the diversity is phenomenal, and the plants are incredible. We've seen chitons and limpets and snails, and it just goes on. Of course, the big megafauna is exciting, but I'm thrilled by the small little isopods and amphipods that I've seen crawling around. So it's been great, lots of diversity. For me, the special thing about this part of the world, South Kiyu Island, is the fact that it is so wild. The rhythms that are out here are very natural. You've got whales, you've got animals, you've got wildlife, you've got squirrels in the trees, you've got all kinds of things going on. What you don't have are horns and sirens and, and uh, alarm clocks and things like that. So it's a very wild place. It's a very different place, I think, than, than I get to spend a lot of my life and a lot of people get to spend their life. So it's, it's kind of fun to be out here just for that reason alone. This area, is, I think, really lends itself to sea kayaking because that water eye view, uh, so much is happening on the water and so much is happening on the shore, right next to the water, where the water and land meet. And I think the ideal way to see that is, is often in a sea kayak. You're quiet, you kind of blend in with the scenery rather than, rather than take over. Watching the terns and the whales and the eagles and you know, seeing uh, wolf paw prints on the beach when we land. You know, you're quieter than you would be in a motorboat and um, I think it's, it's just a totally different experience and you feel so much more connected to the ocean. It's hard to explain, but if you kayak or do other water sports, I'm sure you get it. Whether it's just, you know, beach combing and sitting on the beach, um, there's, the ocean just has that pull. When you're sitting in a boat looking at this structure for the very first time, uh, you realize with the tramways and the helicopter pads and the pier that a tremendous amount of energy went into building this structure at a time in history before helicopters, before sling loading. That to me 
seemed like something that was worth trying to preserve. I mean, the, the history of Cape Station Lighthouse has been constantly evolving. Not just the, the people and the types of people that come here, but the building itself. It's, everything's gone, you know, undergone lots of changes over the years. Um, and our part, um, the, the volunteers who now keep the lighthouse alive are a huge part of the history. Um, we've been here for over 20 years now, and that's maybe a, a quarter of the life of the lighthouse. So we very much play a part in, in keeping um, not just the building going, but the maritime heritage alive and, and spurring interest uh, for people to come out here and just experience this place. It's awesome, the wilderness and, and just a sense of uh, um, grandeur here. So we very much are an important part of that history. My gosh, you know, we've done so much great work from painting to building to shaking to working on trails to building platforms and that, that's all been great. We all make decisions every day. Everything you see around you is a result of decisions that somebody's made, either individually or us as a society. And that includes plastic, that includes single-use plastic, and that includes plastic on the beach. 